heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. Caroline Hyde is off today. This is Bloomberg Technology coming up. Lordstown files for bankruptcy. Shares plunge as the EV makers deal with Foxconn unravels. We'll bring you the details on that developing story. Plus, we'll talk AI and regulation with an MIT researcher who recently sat down with President Biden on his trip to San Francisco. We'll get her takeaways on how the government plans to tackle the booming technology. Plus, we sit down with famed venture capitalist Gary Tan of Y Combinator for an exclusive interview talking investing, the rise of generative AI and how his firm is investing in building back the Bay Area. Uh, First, let's get a check on these markets, starting in the equity markets. We're rebounding when it comes to the technology sector. Look at the Nasdaq 100 up by more than a percentage point, but it follows the biggest two day decline going back to March. Obviously, last week was the biggest weekly drop for that Nasdaq 100 going back to March as well. There's some stability here. Even as yields push high, the U.S. 10-year yield up by around four basis points, 3.75%. A lot of news flow, which we're going to get to with Bloomberg Shanali Basak shortly around Bitcoin. Reports of Fidelity plotting a spot Bitcoin ETF. That has pushed the main digital asset higher. Currently, 30,500 U.S. dollars per token had briefly breached 31,000 US dollars per token. But the actual story that we're really focused on right now is the spin-off, Bitcoin Cash, highest level in more than a year. We're up 7 tenths percent right now, 225 uh, or 226 US dollars per token. We're going to get into the why because it's been an astonishing run. When it comes to names in the technology sector, we are thinking about Lordstown. The news, a chapter 11 filing. We're down 37% right now. We are trading. The stock had been halted. The relationship with Foxconn, which was the contract manufacturer, right, that was going to build Lordstown's electric vehicles, that relationship is disintegrating. Let's get the details with Bloomberg's Sean O'Kane. He covers everything EV and auto startup for us at Bloomberg News. Sean, what is the latest when it comes to Lordstown? Well, we've known this fight was coming for a while, um, and now it's here. We have uh, Lordstown Motors basically saying that from the minute that they started inking these contracts with Foxconn to build the vehicles that Lordstown has spent the last couple of years trying to build, that it went south, that Foxconn started reneging on some of its promises, that it wasn't living up to its funding milestones, that they were basically not showing up to meetings, that the Lordstown CEO went to Taiwan to try to get some information on the vehicles that they wanted to build together and was just basically ghosted at a meeting there. So. Uh, This is a relationship that's been deteriorating pretty quickly over the last half year or so, Um, and we've started to see signs of that in May when Lordstown really started making some noise about this in, in regulatory filings, but now it's really out there in full view. You know, the next question is, is this the end for Lordstown? You know, they kind of relied on Foxconn to build their uh, endurance on their behalf. Do they have other options to move forward? They've been saying for months that they need another outside partner, um, which I always looked at as a pretty big you know, claim, considering that Foxconn was supposed to contract manufacture for these vehicles for them and for Lordstown to come out a couple months ago and say, hey, we actually still need more help from somebody else, another OEM, uh, that it was a pretty big sign that Foxconn was probably not up to snuff. So Lordstown still thinks that it can find a way through. It's still going to try to operate, uh, you know, sort of the core aspects of the business is going to try to keep the lights on while it goes through this chapter 11 proceeding and and uses that restructuring process to give it a bit more of a solid footing to fight foxconn in this lawsuit that it filed today as well uh but we'll see i mean i think the question is have they actually developed over anything over the last three four years of value would either attract a buyer or attract a partner that they've like they've been looking for over the last couple months obviously they haven't found anybody so it's a great point. I mean, I started this year at CES in Las Vegas. As you know, I borrowed one of the endurance pickups. I drove the CEO around for about an hour. There was a truck, at least, you know, an early prototype. What's the wider story here? You know, it, it, we've always kind of viewed Lordstown as one of the pile of EV startups that we we're kind of not really sure about, like the viability of their business and their technology. 
I mean, the, the, the history of the company and the story that they were trying to tell was always just very tangled. I mean, you think back to 2019 and the fact that they bought the company from General Motors or the factory from General Motors that they were supposed to be operating in. It was announced by President Trump uh, in a tweet, and he sort of got it wrong out the gate. He said that Workhorse, which is another startup, that was going to be buying the factory. Uh, and this company was really spun out of Workhorse. There was always this weird relationship between it and Workhorse. It was licensing IP from Workhorse to build this vehicle. It was always this sort of tortured product. And yeah, they were able to get to the point where they were making a few of them with Foxconn, but they were never able to get to the point where they were able to get that cost under uh, the MSRP that they were trying to promise. And even the MSRP had gone up over time. They were originally targeting a lower MSRP. and. They just got to the point where, yeah, they had a vehicle, but it was really not one that was ever going to scale uh, by their own admission. So that's why they started looking for outside help. And they clearly needed that outside help because Foxconn wasn't able or willing to live up to its end of the bargain. So I think now, looking forward, aside from what's going to happen in Lordstown, this just really raises a lot of questions about what Foxconn is going to try to do for EVs in the U.S. It's got big ambitions for that factory in Ohio. but. Right now, we see Lordstown filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. One of the other tenants that's supposed to be in there working with Foxconn had its SPAC merger dissolved uh, earlier this month. And Fisker has already delayed its second vehicle with Foxconn in that building. So that's three out of four partners already that are seeing trouble with Foxconn in that building. All right, Bloomberg, Sean O'Kane on the EVB. One of the top stories on Bloomberg Technology this Tuesday. Thank you. The other top story and kind of activity we're seeing is in the crypto space. US-based payments and crypto firms circle, closely watching regulatory developments in Hong Kong after the territory's new crypto rules went into effect. We sat down with its chairman and CEO to discuss. Have a listen. All around the world, every major market, stablecoin laws are coming into place. And I think what that signifies is that this kind of digital currency these fiat-linked digital currencies right. are about to become a part of the mainstream global financial system. Elsewhere, we're seeing activity in Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. And guess who's here? Bloomberg Shanali Basak with the crypto beat. Let's start with Bitcoin ga Cash, right? It's, it's, a, it's basically doubled in value over a seven-day period. It's the kind of spin-off. Why? What's happening? There are a few things. One, remember, Bitcoin Cash is in fixed supply, and it is now being traded on the new exchange that was started by uh, the backing of Citadel Securities and also Fidelity and large players on Wall Street. And so you do see some activity here, and they are trading only really four assets here. It's Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash. So where Bitcoin in the last seven days, Ed, has risen less than 13 percent, Bitcoin Cash has risen almost 113 percent. So a very meaningful rise there. Uh, but remember, it is not traded as widely uh, as Bitcoin is in particular. So you would see a bigger jump there than you would see at Bitcoin, for example, that is the largest cryptocurrency and is trading at more than $30,000. And remember, that 30000 level, we have been there for about a week or so now, uh, pretty much uh, since we have seen that kind of uh, black rock filing for a spot ETF, giving a lot more institutional support to some of these crypto assets. Well, speaking of the headline which caught my eye and, and moved the needle, uh, in terms of the energy we saw in Bitcoin in, in Tuesday's U.S. morning session was the block reporting that Fidelity yeah. is preparing to submit a spot big Bitcoin ETF filing. What do we know about that? Something that's interesting, if you take a look at the movement here, you saw a pretty significant rise in Bitcoin after the BlackRock ETF filing, which Coinbase would be the custodian of the Bitcoin assets as well. But now the block reporting Fidelity gives you another big investing giant behind the weight of crypto. And this idea here that there could be support even from U.S. regulators to get this done in fuller form. We have plenty of ETFs when it comes to the future markets, the futures markets in the crypto world. But to have this much institutional support behind a spot ETF shows you that perhaps the biggest of Wall Street giants are getting on the, the bandwagon here when it comes to crypto and the idea of getting regulatory support behind it. We know that there are many, many applications in the sidelines here. And the question is, at what point do those become reality and how much more money can that really draw into the system? Bloomberg, Shanali Basak on the crypto beat here on Bloomberg Technology. Thank you so much. Now, coming up, the Biden administration is taking steps to better understand and regulate artificial intelligence. We're going to talk to AI researcher Dr. Joy 
Bola Mwini about the panel and get her view on the risks and rewards of using AI. Just really interesting reaction to her conversation with President Biden. As we head to break, we're also watching shares of Snowflake, the software company announcing an AI-related partnership with NVIDIA that will enable businesses to create customized generative AI apps using their own proprietary data, having a positive effect to the upside, up 3%. As we head to break, here's what RBC's Laurie Calvacina had to say about the NASDAQ earlier today, thinking valuations. This is Bloomberg. I would still stick with tech names. I do think that NASDAQ is getting a little bit overbought. If you look at the CFTC data, we're hitting new highs on NASDAQ mini positioning. That being said, I don't think you have to sort of throw all the growth stocks out at this point. A sector like communication services, where a lot of the internet names are, those earnings revisions are starting to weaken. They're actually staying stronger in tech property. Artificial intelligence startup Stability AI has lost at least two top executives in recent weeks. That includes its head of research and chief operating officer. The departures come the same month that an article in Forbes criticized the startup's stability. Joining us to discuss more is the person that broke that story, Bloomberg's Rachel Metch. Rachel, what do we know? Well, we know that David Ha, who is Stability AI's head of research, uh, left recently. And we also know that Ren Ito, who had been the company's chief operating officer, also left. Um, Stability told me that David had left. Um, sources had told me that David had le left um, on his own, that he had resigned. Um, Stability CEO Imad Mustak told me that um, Ren actually had been, in his words, let go. Interesting. Uh, you very recently spoke with Imad at the Bloomberg Technology Summit. Uh, I, I give our audience a sense of, of what's going on with this company. They're, they're kind of seen as a leader in the field, but you know, despite the name Stability AI, there are some issues that investors as well are concerned about. Yeah, that, that's true. The name uh, has inspired, unfortunately, a few jokes on Twitter in the last 24 hours. Um, is, is it stable or it's not so stable? Um, as some people are saying. I mean, the fact is that uh, some people have had really short tenures at the company, um, and you could see how that might concern people on the outside um, who aren't sure what's happening. Uh, on the other hand, it is true that um, often with a fast-growing early-stage company, which this is, you might have some executive turnover for a bunch of different reasons, right? Um, perhaps uh, you want to bring in more experienced leadership or different leadership, um, and sometimes things just don't work out. Um, so right now, it, you know, we're, we're looking into well, what, what really happened here and what's going to happen going forward. All right, Bloomberg's Rachel Metz, the latest reporting there from Bloomberg Technology and what's happening in the AI space. Let's stick with AI and talk about regulation. Dr. Jo Joy Bolamwini is the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League and an AI researcher at MIT. Just last week, she sat with President Biden to discuss artificial intelligence and joins us now from New York. We'll get to that conversation with President Biden in a moment. You listened there to what Rachel had to say. How do you see the pace of innovation right now in AI startups? And does it trouble you how quickly some of these companies are moving and then changing direction? Yes, I am extremely troubled with how quickly we are releasing generative AI systems without the transparency to know where the data is coming from. And also, we continue to see data being taken without consent, without compensation. And you're going to continue to see increasing uh, lawsuits against companies uh, that are built on what some would say is stolen uh, data. You had Meta Facebook settle $650 million when it came to violating the BIPA, Biometric Information Privacy Act of Illinois. So I think it's extremely risky for companies to be building on unstable foundations. Dr. Joy, what were the specifics of your discussion with President Biden? Yes, artificial intelligence, but what did he want to know? 
So I was very encouraged by how engaged President Biden was at the round table. And we started off discussing the possibilities of AI for healthcare, for education, but quickly focused on real world harms of AI. And so I focused on racial bias, gender bias, and known uh, false matches that have led to false arrests, such as the case of Robert Williams, who was arrested in front of his two young daughters and his wife due to faulty AI system. So that was certainly uh, top of mind. I also think there's an opportunity for the U.S. to lead on biometric rights, but right now we're going in the opposite direction. Last week, we had EU lawmakers push forward the EU AI Act, which has a provision that bans the use of live facial recognition in public places. While this is happening here in the U.S., we have the TSA rolling out domestic facial recognition, and most people don't even know that they can opt out. So that's why we're doing the TSA scorecard, fly.ajl.org, to actually hear from travelers. Was there notice? Was there consent? Was there signage? What happened if you try to opt out? Could you actually opt out with out consequences. So we certainly discussed where the U.S. could lead when it comes to biometrics rights. Dr. Joy, it's interesting the comparison between the European Union and what we see in the United States. D did President Biden give you any sort of indication or pledge that the U.S. will kind of be more active in regulating or at least acting on a framework um, in terms of guardrails for, for artificial intelligence technology? Well, something that I was encouraged to see last year from the Biden-Harris administration was the release of a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. And I think that's exactly the way the U.S. should approach regulating uh, AI, right, which is a rights-based framework. And so here you would have, protect you would have specific protections against algorithmic discrimination. There would be notice and explanation. There would be privacy when it comes to data and consent. And these systems would have to be shown to be safe and effective. In the case of Robert Williams being uh, uh, falsely arrested, the system wasn't even effective. But even if we had more effective biometric systems, this then can lead to mass state surveillance, which is not the society we want to have here in the United States. At MIT, tell me about your research. What are you focused on? So my research looks into bias in various types of AI systems. So probably most known for the Gender Shades paper, which showed racial bias and gender bias in commercially sold projects, products from IBM, Microsoft. Later on, we also did uh, Amazon as well. Right now with the Algorithmic Justice League, we're focused on real world harms. How are people experiencing AI systems being used for access to government uh, services? So for example, we know that the IRS put on board ID.me as a way of accessing basic uh, tax information. But we launched a campaign and we heard from many people saying that they were having so many different issues, not just from the technical side, but also from a privacy side. And when you have a company that says to use our system, you waive your right to sue, but there's no other way to access that government service, we are moving in the wrong direction. But it's not too late to course correct. Dr. Joy, the, the, the core of your research and, and, and your role is, is looking at the societal risks of AI. But how do you yourself use artificial intelligence tools? Would you say that you are pro-AI uh, as, as a tool to advance mankind? I am optimistic about using ethical AI systems. And what I try to do is say, are the AI systems that I would like to use built on an ethical pipeline? And if not, are there ways we can uh, shift that? I'm very excited, for example, with what we're seeing with AI and healthcare. There's a startup called Bloomer Tech where they've identified a major health gap which is about one in three women die of cardiovascular disease, but less than a quarter of research participants are women when it comes to actually studying the disease. So we have a very male-centric model 
of heart disease, and this does mean that women have worse outcomes. So they've developed this innovation of, of smart fabrics that can give you digital biomarkers. And they are also addressing this data gap because there's such a lack of data when it comes to women's heart health. So those sorts of areas, I'm very excited about the possibilities where AI isn't taking away livelihoods, but improving uh, life outcomes. Dr. Joy Bolamwini reflecting on that meeting with President Biden here in San Francisco last week. Thank you so much for your time Thank out you. in New York. Thank you. Now, coming up, Baidu is claiming that its AI bot, Ernie, is beating ChatGPT on key measures. Details next. This is Bloomberg. Time for talking tech. First up, India's Baiju is talking with prospective new shareholders for a $1 billion fundraising round, seeking delay investors who want to clip its founders' control. The education tech firm is offering sweeteners to win over new backers, including preferential treatment in the case of liquidation. Plus, Baidu's ChatGPT-style service called Ernie has outperformed OpenAI's seminal product on several measures in China. That's according to a statement from China's search leader, who implies the latest iteration of Baidu's foundation model won't have to compete with OpenAI directly in China. And Meta has quadrupled the number of companies using its WhatsApp business tool in the past three years. The app now has more than 200 million customers, up from 50 million in the middle of 2020, making headway in a push to generate more money from the popular messaging service. Right, coming up, we're going to continue our conversation on all things artificial intelligence and speak to one entrepreneur in this space, Joseph Miller. He's a former Bridgewater hedge fund employee. He joins us next to discuss the launch of his new app, Quiver, which uses AI and the blockchain for digital identity. Loads more to come here on Bloomberg Technology from here in San Francisco. Focus on AI. And don't forget, Gary Tan's coming up. Why Combinator? That is one you don't want to miss. A gloomy day in San Francisco, but a beautiful show. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Let's check in on the markets. And it is the technology sector that is powering this kind of rebound we're seeing in equities. NASDAQ 100 up by more than a percentage point. Follows Friday and Monday session that gave us the biggest two-day drop on the NASDAQ 100 going back to March. Even as bond yields kind of pushing higher up three basis points on the U.S. 10-year yield, 3.75%. In crypto, the story has been about Bitcoin Cash, this spin-off from 2017. It was at a time where you know, software engineers were banking on anything with Bitcoin in the name being a success. But it has become an altcoin that's become popular, a 100% gain in a, in a sort of seven to nine day span. And we continue to push higher, 1.8% trading at the highest level since May of 2022. More headlines this morning giving energy to the the crypto space as well. In terms of single name movers, there's no huge focus on any one theme. We are looking at Palo Alto Networks, hit a fresh record high, 3.5% gain, $252 a share. In the AI space and now to the downside, but we've kind of clawed black some back some of the declines is Alphabet, parent of Google, Bernstein out with a note saying this was a stock that was like a warm hug. 
but it's time to sit on the sidelines because there are some risks about the shift from generative to generative AI that could impact its ad streams uh, in the near term. Sat, sit on the sidelines, but hoping to come back to it. I thought that was an interesting note, but it has impacted the shares, had been much lower now off by two tenths of 1%. Now, sticking with generative AI, Mizuho is rolling out access to Microsoft's Azure OpenAI service this week allowing 45,000 employees to test out the product in its core lending units. The firm is seeking ideas from workers in Japan on how to best use the technology. All right, let's stick with the conversation in AI. Joining us now is Joseph Miller, the co-founder and chief data science scientist for Quiver, venture-backed consumer app for validating and monetizing digital identity. Prior to Quiver, Joseph, you're a manager at Bridgewater Associates who focused on building AI decision-making systems for senior management, and you also co-founded Viven, the world's first AI-powered platform for aligning sales and product and tech companies. You know, Bridgewater, just a giant hedge fund, right? Ray Dalio is where my mind goes. But when you hear that story about Mizuho, another sort of financial institution on a global scale, rolling out a generative AI tool to its employees, what do you think? You've been in this domain. You know how difficult it is. Yeah, I think that uh, it's a good question. So I think that generative AI does a lot of things for um, startups like, you know, I'm a serial entrepreneur doing these things, building products. I think that um, it does it has enabled us to do things that we otherwise weren't able to do at scale, um, but also brand new technology. So like, we're, you know, Quiver is a, a series seed company. Like we're a small group, we're just starting up. And uh, you know, to be able to do the sort of uh, generative AI, the natural language processing at scale that, um, that you're able to do now uh, with you know, a simple API key is, um, is pretty unbelievable. And it's allowing us to do things that are, um, was otherwise prohibited before. We will get into Quiver in just a moment and talk about the specific use case that you're trying to crack. But when, when you left Bridgewater, did you consider developing an AI product or platform that could be used in the world of, of mar financial markets and, and financial institutions? Yes, actually. Um, so when I left, I also started working on um, out trading algorithms of my own, um, mostly based in causal inference. And, and, um, and the, the biggest use case for generative AI or really LLM models is actually the synthesis of the amount of data that you have to, to crunch in order to try to understand the market, right? And uh, being able to do that, again, like I said, being able to do that at scale is a thing that has really only become available um, and possible in, say, the last few years. So, so Quiver, let's get into it. The, the, the primary artificial intelligence use case is to protect the badging process. Well, yes. what is the badging process? That's right. So, so Quiver is, we're trying to do something a little different with digital identity. I think that people tend to think about digital identity as like a KYC, know your customer, you know, what's your social security number, what's your driver's license, uh, where do you live, this kind of stuff. Um, and instead, what we wanted to do is focus on the more human aspects of our identity and create a platform where people can aggregate all of these different facets they have on different platforms right now. You know, your music preferences might sit on Spotify. Um, maybe your lifestyle preferences are sitting in somewhere in, in some collection of Instagram photos and Twitter tweets and things like this. And we wanted to create a space where you could bring all of that together and represent yourself more holistically. And, um, and of course, uh, not, you know, the things that make us most interesting are often not online at all. And so the question is, how do you bring that online and, uh, and how do you get that validated? And so we have this social protocol that uh, allows people to create videos and submit evidence that gets voted on by the community. Um, and, and you get validated for that way too. So for example, if you're a dog lover, like there's probably not, you know, that's a silly thing, but it's it's a big aspect of our humanity, right? So when you put that next to, say, your accolades and, you know, you worked at Bridgewater, but you're also a dog lover, it makes you more human. And I think a big part that is missing in the internet is that aspect of our humanity. And um, so that's what we're trying to do. And then, of course, our AI use case there is, um, this is obviously very uh, delicate, right? We need, um, we need a lot of trust in this space. And so, um, again, going back to like things like agent models and AI, um, it allows us to do, um, to protect that authenticity and that validation process at scale in a way that was completely impossible even six months ago. Joseph, I'm almost certain that a big portion of the Bloomberg technology audience are dog lovers. It's okay, <laughs> it's not silly. Um, 
It's built on graph AI algorithms. Explain the underlying technology to me. What is the, the point of difference there on a graph AI algorithm? Yeah, so, it, it, so what we have is a, is a sort of graph that connects all of the users and their interests and their likes. Um, and then what we can do in that is do community detection. We can look at uh, fraud detection. We can look at if there are bad actors in the community or if there's a group of people that are sort of um, taking over some sort of uh, some some you know niche of the uh, of the uh, of the badge like library if you will um, if there's things like um, prejudice if there's things like you know uh, people trying to um, you know discriminate in, in systematic ways the graph allows us to suss that out and see and, and detect these bad actors Joseph Miller of Quiver formerly of Bridgewater thank you so much for your time thank you very much all right, so coming up, the Y Combinator's summer 2023 batch has officially started. We'll get all the details with CEO Gary Tan in an exclusive interview coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. time for VC Spotlight, and today we're going to talk about Y Combinator. YC hosts two three-month programs a year to help a select group of startups and founders in an accelerator program. One program runs from January through March, and the other from June through August. The summer 2023 batch has officially started, and for the first time since the pandemic, YC is hosting the group in person and all in the Bay Area. Of the 4,000 startups YC is funded since 2005. Many have become household names, including Airbnb and Stripe. Joining us to discuss, Gary Tan, the CEO of Y Combinator. Welcome to Bloomberg Technology. It's great to have you here in person. Thank you so much for having me. In San Francisco. Indeed, in the epicenter of tech. In, and we will get to that. And that is your message to this class of summer 2023. Why so insistent that this group be here in person. Absolutely. So as you know, Y Combinator funds people at the earliest possible stage, sometimes when it's literally just an idea and a couple co-founders. And so really in order to go from zero to one, to create something that has never existed before, there's nothing like having the energy of people in person, not just right next to each other, writing the code and shipping it to users. You know, that you could do from any living room or any bedroom in the world. Uh, there's something special about hundreds of founders coming together and actually helping each other. Um, and that's really why YC has been so successful over the number of years. Well, it really we're saying Bay Area, but really the message from you is San Francisco. Yeah, I think San Francisco in particular with the AI boom is uh, really about Cerebral Valley, which we call Hayes Valley right down the street. Interesting. There's something very special happening here where literally the foundational models, the open source, the smartest people in the world are sitting in those cafes uh, you know, having discussions not just about starting their companies, but also what is the cutting edge of what these AI models can do. Let's go through the mechanics of it. You know, the initial investment pledge is 500,000 US dollars to each of the startups, and then a three-month program, you know, going through the operational side of things. But, but what happens in that time? Absolutely. I think the most important thing that's crazy to me is uh, the people who start these companies, they are the most eminent of all of the people who could be starting companies at that moment. So we had more than 24,000 applications for about 240 spots. 24,000 was a record. That's right. So our acceptance rate was just under 1%, which it's never been as selective as today. But that means that those people in that room, they actually go on to become the most eminent people in startup -dom. Sorry to interrupt, but what does that data represent? If you had the most applications on record and you're accepting the fewest on record, what does that tell you about the big picture of this economy? Well, I think at the end of the day, we're trying to set these founders up for success. And so, you know, if there is ongoing high interest rates, one of the things that we're really trying to focus on is how do we make sure the founders we do fund are the people who are most likely to go on and succeed. And so, you know, in a time of cheap capital, that means that Maybe we can fund more people in a time of more distress, like right now. We have to be much more mindful of what are those businesses and 
you know, can we see really great revenue, great gross margin? And that's one of the big reasons why today we launched our top companies list that's on our website today. We, we can discuss the top companies list. I think I want to go back to the mechanics because what surprises so many people, whether you call Y Combinator an accelerator or an incubator, it's just a three-month program. How can you get anything done in that time? Well, I think the cool thing that I get to do is I get to work with uh, 12 of some of my closest friends who are uh, known as group partners. And the big thing that's different now is uh, actually, as CEO, uh, I am actually also a group partner. So we actually have 13 people working with the companies. And so these are some of the people who literally work with these top revenue and top valuation companies uh, from the zero to one stage, literally a few people just starting out uh, for me. I got the privilege of working with Apoor Vimeta from Instacart or Brian Armstrong from Coinbase uh, or Kyle Vogt from Cruise Automation. These are all companies that have gone on to sort of change both their industry but also tech broadly. Uh, but I can't tell you how crazy it is to meet people when uh, it's literally a YC application on the web. And that's really, I think, uh, one of the great innovations of our time that Paul Graham, the founder of YC, came up with. Here's this website where you can right. go to ycombinator.com slash apply and anyone with an idea anywhere in the world on the internet can apply and someone will go and read it and our, our community will figure out, hey, should this person be a part of our community? Of the 24,000 that applied and then the 240 that were accepted, I guess the question goes to like, what do they have in common? Or, or, or paradoxically, are any of them not AI companies? Oh, yeah. So actually only 35% of the companies in this batch are specifically AI focused. I'd say maybe half of them have some AI component. Uh, YC has always been generalist. You know, that's how YC was able to fund uh, Coinbase really even years before anyone had even heard of Bitcoin. Um, and I think the, the key message here is that the best people in the world to sort of create these startups are actually the technologists, the, the builders who are just a few people writing lines of code. It's a very fringe thing. And what YC does is take people who otherwise would be on the fringe, but they're some of the most br technically and engineering-wise brilliant people in the world. And, you know, we sort of teach them how the pieces move. You know, we teach them chess, the part of, uh, you know, building a business that, uh, frankly, is the easier part to being highly technical and being on the cutting edge of what's happening in technology. Gary, how do you ensure you've got the funds to deploy every year for two programs? Is there still LP interest in, in backing you? Absolutely. I mean, one of the amazing things about YC is if you look at every single top venture capital firm in the world, uh, pretty much all of them have a YC company that is either on their homepage or so and often uh, multiple of them that have become fund returners for those VC funds. So to me, uh, YC is... Are they is, becoming LPs in, in themselves? I mean, where are you getting the, the funds from, oh, uh, generally speaking? All the same kind of limited partners okay. that uh, you, know, you would expect in venture capital. And that makes sense because YC, to me, is actually the fountain of prosperity for this type of activity in the world. Two pieces of news. So we've got through the class of summer 2023. You're also publishing this list of the top net revenue generating companies you backed in 2022, private or otherwise. Why? I mean, those are two different scales, ends of the scale. Yeah. You know, the, the reality is, and this is no news to anyone, uh, you know, 2021 was such an extreme sort of time. And one of the things that we became very concerned about, because we actually want to be a bellwether of trying to teach the next generation what they should focus on, there was this over-reliance on thinking about what's my next round. You know, the fast money meant that you were going to chase top-line metrics. Costs. Growth at all costs. And, of course, now we're on the other side of a very deep hangover about that. Um, and so... We thought, how do we as a community put forward the things that founders and people who are sort of creating this technology, what should they be thinking about? And right now, uh, you know, now more than ever, it's about uh, gross margin. It's actually about net revenue. Sort of you know, one of the things I'm calling it is literally edible revenue. And one of the wild things... What do you things, mean by edible revenue? Oh, just can you pay people? Can you, uh, you know, pay salaries? Can you actually run your operations on this revenue? And uh, what's funny is looking at the different uh, financial and accounting sort of shenanigans that people pull, often it's about sort of hiding this number. So I think maybe we should make this uh, an industry standard. Like should, you know, whether or not it's a marketplace or, you know, 
there are lots of different specific accounting rules for specific comps, but why is that? Shouldn't we just use one met metric that actually will allow founders to make the right decision, which is to build great sustainable companies and know that they can grow uh, over the long term? We should talk about San Francisco and where to build for the long term. I mean, y your position on this city is well known, but as of today, wh wh where's your head at? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, the great thing about San Francisco to me is that uh, it gave me everything I have. I learned to code in the city, taking BART into Petrero Hill in Web 1.0. I learned how to make database-backed websites. And what I realize is San Francisco and the Bay Area is the place that is the magnet for all of the most technical people in the world. And when you have those type of agglomeration effects, when you have all the smartest, most brilliant, most driven people yes. in the world coming here, of course they're going to create wealth. But we have problems as well, and you've been very vocal acknowledging them. Absolutely. And I guess where my question goes is how much more deeply you would be involved in political cycles, putting money into initiatives and candidates, you yourself being involved in politics. Well, some of my friends started an organization called Grow SF, which is one of the most important things. How do we take uh, really some of the smartest people who have created this wealth, and how do we have an impact that's positive on our local economy? We want that wealth to actually be shared with everyone. I think a lot of people criticize tech and tech people broadly as sort of Ayn Randian libertarians. And uh, speaking for myself and my friends, you know, we're not Randians. We're Gene Roddenberry. Uh, type of, you know, Gene Roddenberry is sort of our uh, spiritual future. You know, what we believe is Starfleet Academy was in San Francisco for a reason, and we can actually build San Francisco into San Francisco if we actually have the right policies and the right politicians in place. And in November of 2024, I think if you follow Grow SF, you'll see our plan to the, make that happen. This is the first opportunity I've had to speak to you since the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, and, and the, the commonality of Y Combinator is that SVB was often the first institution to write a check. Bloomberg reported last week that the FDIC had mistakenly released this document to our news organization that revealed the, the backstop on all depositors with balances exceeding 250000 was also inclusive of Sequoia and many large uh, tech startups that uh, didn't need it, frankly. And you were an advocate for that initiative in the first place, but on the smaller side of things. What's your kind of thoughts on that and reaction? Absolutely. You know, I, I think the hard part about SVB is that it really did hit the little guy. You know, what I realized for us, you know, YC has funded over 4,000 companies. And of course, the top 100, top 200 are some of the biggest names that you could think of. Uh, but what the, the, the uh, backstop was really about was saving the tens of thousands of small and medium-sized businesses that literally would not be able to make payroll. And I think this fact coming out doesn't change any of that. We would have set back technology uh, perhaps you know, five yes. years, perhaps a decade, if you just suddenly killed you know, at a very early stage of company. And so you know, I hear that argument, but the truth remains that there were hundreds of thousands of jobs that were saved in that moment. And I think the Fed and the FDIC and the people in charge, they did the right thing. Gary, when I think of you, I think of also about Initialized, and you returned to YC in January. Um, you were the key man alongside Alexis Ahanian, and you've, you've kind of come back to YC. Quickly, how did that conversation go with LPs of Initialized, and is it now just all Alexis at Initialized? Oh, so Alexis left to start his own fund called 776 okay. a number of years ago. Uh, the new managing partners are Brett Gibson and Jen Wolf. They've done incre an incredible job. I mean, the number one thing I love is that in venture, uh, the best and highest to me is not to elevate a single person, but to really create an institution that lasts well beyond uh, anyone who sort of started the business. And, you know, I looked at Paul Graham and Jessica Livingston who created YC, YC for us. They're still there, but, you know, they made space for what is now an institution, and I am merely the steward of that institution going forward. Y Combinator CEO Gary Tan, we're so grateful for your time here in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>
This is going viral. Taylor Swift's Eras Tour is on track to become the biggest in concert history and could potentially gross over a billion dollars. That milestone would break the record for global concert tours currently held by Elton John, followed by Ed Sheeran. Swift will play 106 concerts by next summer, including 54 shows overseas. That does it, guys, for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. So much to recap. Don't forget the podcast wherever you get yours. Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and of course, Bloomberg. From San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology.